Um, all right, so if you guys want to open up your Bibles uh, this morning to Luke, we're going to be in chapter 21. Let's see if I can even find it. I think I can. And we're going to read through verse 1 through 4, but before we do that, I'm going to say hi to Ethan over here, if that's all right. Hey, buddy. How's it going? I'm good. I'm better now that you're right there. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So before we jump in, uh, I want to share just uh, some updates about the coming weeks because we've been on this journey through the book of Luke going on two years. So it's, it's been a long journey. That journey is coming to an end. Uh, so we're really excited about that. So I kind of want to break down what to expect uh, in, in the month of December here at Grassroots Revival, and um, especially in regards to the ending of the book of Luke. If you don't want to miss the, the end of this uh, epic journey that we've been on, you're going to want to be here um, throughout December. And so this week we're going to, well, I'm not going to spoil what we're going to talk about, but next week we're going to talk about end times. So if you're interested in end times and, and things like that, uh, we're going to do a whole chapter in Luke. It's going to kind of open up that can of worms. And uh, we're, I, I have a, a, an idea of where we're going to go with that. We're not going to focus on one idea of what the end looks like, but the three mainstream ideas um, that, that, you know, in mainstream Christianity, what people believe about end times and uh, the study of end times. And I'm going to break them down so that you kind of know what they all mean and let you decide for yourself what, what you think. I think that's fair. And I'll, I'll probably share what I what. I feel is right, but um, there's a lot of mystery in all that, and so, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who is going to let it play out, and, you know, if, if it happens a little different than what I thought, you know what, hey, so be it. I still trust the Lord. Uh, so we're going to do that, and then after that, we're going to break the last couple chapters of Luke up. So one week, we're going to do the, the Last Supper with, with Jesus hanging out with his guys uh, in the uh, Betrayal. So Judas betrays Jesus, a little bit of a spoiler, if you haven't, you know, heard, heard the story. You're, you're like, what? I was really rooting for Judas. Dang it, he was my favorite disciple. Uh, I don't, never heard, I've never heard anybody say that, but it just, I want to be sensitive to who might be listening, so Sorry. Doesn't turn out so good. And then uh, the, the next week, we're going to do the uh, talk about the crucifixion. So we're going to go through that. And then the following week, we're going to land on the resurrection and the ascension. So we're going to close out the, the rest of the book of Luke. And that's going to be the day before Christmas Eve. And so on Christmas Eve, we're having a little get together here um, with some Christmas carols, some cookies and cocoa. That was my idea, was my contribution to that. So you're welcome. Um, <laughs> And we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus. So everything has come full circle. And uh, the last Saturday in December, we're going to uh, cast vision for 2024. So that's December, a lot of good Saturdays that you probably won't want to miss. Um, so I'll be looking for your faces because I'll know that I told at least this group right here. And uh, we'll see how serious you take what I tell you as your pastor. No, I'm kidding. Make it if you can. It'll be fun. But uh, today we're going to be in chapter 21, verse 4, 1 through 4, and we're going to talk about giving because we have our annual Christmas gift. It's, it's kind of running right now. And what that is, if you guys haven't heard about it yet, it's just once a year. I don't know if you notice this, but Grassroots Revival isn't the kind of church that's going to hound you for your money every five seconds that you're here, okay? You know, we, you know we, we leave that in your hands to, to do as God leads you to do. Uh, but once a year, we are going to uh, challenge ourselves, including myself, so don't think I'm just talking to you, I'm talking to me, to give above and beyond what I would normally give, um, you know, in, in my regular tithing or giving. And uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today throughout this message. And the reason that we're going to talk about that is it's really nice to get a, uh, a, a jump. Well, this is one of the reasons. Actually, we're going to talk about a deeper reason. This is kind of more of a practical reason, but it's nice to be able to get a jump start on the, the, the vision and mission stuff we want to accomplish in the upcoming year. Uh, so when I say, you know, we're going to challenge ourselves to give more, that could be a dollar more. 
Uh, that could be $2 more. That could be $1,000 more. I, it, it is whatever that, whatever that looks like for you, it's just more. Maybe you're like, I, well, I don't give anything, so am I off the hook? No, give a dollar, you know, like give something, uh, you know, now or in the next month, you know, start somewhere. There's no judgment on any of that. It's just a challenge to go a little bit above and beyond um, and, and finish out the year strong. But we're going to talk about, I think, a, a more important aspect of, of why giving is important through this sermon today. That's just a really practical thing, you know, uh, running a church and um, all the stuff that goes along with it, it costs money, right? So that, that's just real. And uh, some of the plans that we have for the future is it's going to cost money. Um, that's just that's the way that, that it is, and, and I, I can't do nothing about it. If I could, I would have by now. I would just grow the money tree right here, and we would pluck from it as needed, and we'd be okay. But the Lord uh, has, has uh, bigger plans for us in regards to money, and we're going to talk about that this morning. So, Father God, we thank you for your word, and uh, Lord, yeah, seriously, thank you, because it is literally the, the, the steady line that we have in, in a world full of craziness. And it's so um, incredible that we have a place to go to find out what you say about something, that we don't have to turn on the news and hear somebody else's opinion or get on YouTube and, you know, just, again, hear people's opinions, but we can actually find out what's true. And uh, so, Father God, we thank you for that. And, and Lord, we... Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so here we go. Uh, verse 1 through 4, it says, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Sound like pennies, right? Bless you. God bless you. John... That's a real blessing from a real pastor right there, okay? I'm keeping it. You should. <laughs> All right, let's jump back in before we started blessing each other. That's good. We can take a minute to bless each other, right? That's all right. Yeah, bless everybody in this room, not just the guy who sneezed. Although, double portion for you, my friend. No, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Take it. Okay, here we go. So as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small, two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Okay, so some really cool stuff going on here. Um, in, in one of the translations that I, I like to read, which is the NASB, it talks about that these people are giving out of their surplus. And I, I kind of like that, that rendering a little bit better um, than just out of their wealth. Because when you say out of their wealth, it's like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, people out of their wealth should give. But when you talk about surplus, it's, it's really kind of talking about this, the, 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 the money that they have that's the extra. It's, yeah, it's the, exactly, it's the whatever. It's the above and beyond, uh, you know, money that somebody might, might have. It sounds like a pretty good problem to have, huh? How many of you guys want that problem? I mean, I love to just give out of the surplus, and, you know, but, but, it's, it's not actually really costing these people something. And I, you know, I, I, this, something that drives me crazy that you see with like the, the one percenters, the really, really rich people. And I'm not saying anything bad about these people. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not trying to throw shade on people with money. I, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't think that, I do believe that the Lord, um, you know, prospers people. And I, I'm not trying to create a theology around being poor. Not doing that. But what drives me crazy is when I hear about billionaire, billionaires giving $10 million to a charity. And then everybody pats them on the back like they are giving so much money. And I'm like, they have $130 billion. They gave $10 million away. Like they, they, they could give away $30 billion and probably cha you know, solve a ton of world problems, but they don't do that. 
They don't do that. They give away $10 million or $8 million. And listen, I'm glad that they do. I'm just saying it always kind of bugs me that it's looked at as like some amazing thing when it's like, I don't know, they're, they might be doing that just to get like their ta- a tax break or something. You know, I, I don't know the reasoning. I'm just saying that scenario reminds me of what Jesus is talking about is that you got all this money and sure you give some away because it honestly doesn't really make much of a difference at the end of the day. And from the scripture that I'm reading, it sounds like these people feel pretty good about giving from the surplus because here you got somebody adding two cents and here's this person dropping in, you know, I don't even know, a thousand dollars or whatever. And Jesus is saying, you know what? There's actually more value on the person who they gave less, but they actually gave more, right? And that's, that's to me, I mean, it's, it's so just the kingdom of God. So many things in the kingdom work, you know, opposite of what, how we would want them to work. Because for us, we would be like, no, 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 more is more. I don't care how much that poor person gave. I gave $10,000, right? That's really easy to fall into that mindset. But I love that Jesus is like, he's not even putting the value on the, the money itself. He's putting value on the heart that is behind it. So you could give, you know, a dollar and you might say like, well, I only have a dollar, but Jesus is like, oh my gosh, he's, you know, he's up there in heaven gathering the angels and they're looking down. It's like, he gave a dollar. Oh my, he only had 10. He's got nine left. You know, and that's, that's the, the, the kind of value that God puts on things. It's always the heart behind it. It's not the amount. I think that's cool. You know, giving, you know, large amounts or whatever, I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, give what the Lord puts on your heart to give. But if you're just giving the money that you don't care about anyway, (laughs) bless you. Oh, my gosh. Dad, we got a lot of ministry to do after service here. Wow, a lot of blessings. So you be ready. Um. But it, it is, it's not a, a, about the, the amount, it's about the heart behind the giving. And, and that's what Jesus is pointing out. He's like, wow, look at that. She is literally giving away her last two cents to the church. And I don't think that Jesus is making a case here for you to go empty your bank account today. So don't hear also what I don't think Jesus is saying. I don't think that, that that's like, you know, we don't want to walk away and say like, okay, I just need to give away everything. If the Lord is asking you to, then you should, okay? But I'm not, I'm not the one to, to tell you what the Lord is asking you to give. I'm just saying that when you give and it hurts a little bit, the Lord, he sees that. He's not looking at it as like it's nothing or insignificant. He's actually really proud of you um, for trusting him with your future. And that's what I want to talk about today uh, the most because I think that's what the, the coolest aspect of giving is, is our, is our um, opportunity to trust God for our provision. And that's the, you know, that's the whole backward thing about, uh, you know, that, that feels backward about giving is how many of you guys in here, you know, sometimes worry about having provision? Anybody or is it just me? Okay, everybody? All right, anybody not? Yeah, come on. Okay, that's a, a pretty common um, experience for, for human beings is to worry a little bit, especially when it comes to, like, am I going to have enough, right? And... I really believe that the Lord wants us to get in a place where we are actually at peace with our future and our need for provision because we know that it's him who provides for us. It's not all these random, scary things that we can't control. And I think that's kind of part of it is that we fear because we're looking at the the systems out there, my job or the economy or whatever, you name it. And we're thinking that's my source of provision. And those things are crazy, right? Those things are changing all the time. I mean, gas price is like a roller coaster. You never know where it's going to go next. I mean, it's like the, the, the economy can crash, man. We've seen it before. You know, I hear people all the time. They're telling me like, man, have you ever heard of hyperinflation? Like we need to sell everything and buy a bunch of gold. And I'm like, okay, if the Lord is literally telling you to do that, do that. But if your fear is telling you to do that, don't do that. Don't do that. Because my security does not rest in the American economy. 
It doesn't rest in my job. That's not where I get security. I get security because I belong to Jesus. And I believe that he's not brought me out here into what can sometimes feel like the wilderness just to die. That there is a promised land, there is a future and a hope that God has for me. And so the world could be falling to pieces, but I have faith that, man, maybe the economy does take a dive, but yet somehow I'm still prospering. Somehow I still have what I need. And my neighbors might look and go like, it does not make sense that you have food on the table right now. And I'm like, well, that's because my security comes from my, my God. He is my provider. You know, uh, my job, does it, does it bring in income? Yes, it does, but, you know, I, I, first of all, I don't put my provision in a box that is just called Nick's job. I've, I've seen uh, finances come in in ways that were not related to my job enough times to know that God can make up the lack any time that he wants. Any time that he wants. And I've just learned it's better to trust God with my future than waste time living in fear today. How many of you guys know that you, if, 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 you just, if you choose to be fearful today, you just, you're not, chances are tomorrow you're going to find out that all the stories you told yourself today were all BS. <laughs> they didn't even happen. But the saddest thing is, is you cannot get that time back. You don't get it back. You just wasted it being afraid. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that, that fear does, but one of them is just not even healthy to live in a state of fear and stress, like your body wasn't designed to carry those, those kind of weights. Um, one of my favorite quotes, you know, and I've shared this from Mark Twain uh, when he was old, said uh, that he said, many fears I've had throughout my life, he said, most of which never happened, you know? So it's, it's like, <laughs> isn't that true? We're always telling ourselves the, the story that it's not going to work out or we're going to be in trouble. We're not going to have. And we end up spending a lot of time like begging God to save us. And we're not even really sinking yet. <laughs> the house isn't even on fire. And we're like, but it will be. I know it. It will be. And, and we just spend a lot of time in fear and that fear really robs us from um, being able to live the, the kingdom life that God has called us to live. If, if we spend a lot of our energy and, you know, our, our thought life rooted in anxiety and fear, man, you know, that's just, that, 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 first of all, as we talk about giving, we're probably not going to give very much because we're freaked out, right? right? And, it, it, and it, it probably even, you know, in that, I've had times where I felt the Lord tell me to give, especially like early on. Now, now I give a lot better. But when I first started giving, I would be freaked out. And I could feel the Lord telling me to give something, and I would withhold it, and I would, with good intention, you know, like I would convince myself, like, uh, better be safe than sorry, you know. But again, that's not trusting the Lord. And so today, to, to illustrate this a little bit better, I've somehow was able to weave in the story of David and Goliath into this, this message. That's pretty awesome, right? Come on, man. Who, who doesn't love the story of David killing Goliath? Maybe you've only heard that story in Sunday school. And if you ha have, I, I, I apologize on behalf of your children's pastor. I used to be a youth pastor. We need to tell the Bible as it's actually written, okay? Because the first time I opened up the Bible and actually read that story, and I heard the story in Sunday school and all that, and I thought it was lame, thought it was stupid about some boy with a little slingshot. And then I actually opened up the Word of God and read it. I was like, this is the coolest story I've ever read. There's all this trash talking. There's like just straight up like beheadings, and it's crazy. This is in the Bible. And that was the first time I realized like, wow, the Bible's actually really cool. Uh, it's not like soft. I, you know, you get this, this picture of uh, Christianity from watching The Simpsons, and you see Ned Flanders and Oakley, <laughs> right? So you, you kind of like portray that on to like, I'm not going to open that Bible. It's probably just full of a bunch of nerds, you know? And then you open it up and you're like, actually, this is really cool. I'm really entertained at being, uh, you know, not just entertained, but just being blessed by God's word. So I'm going to tell you guys a story 
about David uh, in, in his fight against Goliath. And so David was uh, a, 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 a young man that was, um, that was prophesied would become uh, king and anointed to become king to take the place of the existing king. Uh, he's not the son of the king, so this is a bit of a stretch, right? Because usually the son of a king would take the king's place. David is not King Saul's son. Um, so he's actually Jesse's son. And he's the youngest. He's got some brothers, and his brothers um, in this story have gone to war with Israel, and they're out fighting the Philistines. You know, it's, usually it's the Philistines, right? Those dirty dogs. And they're out there, and they're in this valley, and they're facing off in front of each other. Like, there's one uh, army over here, and then there's Israel on this side, and King Saul, and all David's brothers are hanging out, and, and they're, they've been out here for 40 days and 40 nights, and, and there's this big dude that has come out. He's got a little guy carrying a shield. I kind of imagine a hobbit, but I, it's probably not a hobbit. <laughs> it says a shield bearer. It's, and it's Goliath, and he's, he's huge, and he's strong, and it gives, actually, it gives you some details about how big he is. He's a very, very big, strong man. And he's out there, and he's taunting the armies of, of Israel, the, like the armies of the living God, really, and he's actually uh, has everybody afraid. And so all these men of war are out there, and they're terrified of this Goliath. They're not willing to do anything. And Goliath is pretty much saying, he's, he's making it real simple. It's like, look, you guys, you know, you, you send out your best warrior. If, if he, well, this is Philistines, if he can beat our best warrior, hey, check it out. We're done. Like, you guys win. We'll, you know, I think they'll even serve them or, or whatever. But if it's the other way around, if Goliath beats your guy, we win. So we can avoid all the bloodshed. Let's just have one good fight and let's see who can win. And this has been going on for days. And nobody has the courage to step up to Goliath. Now, David, meanwhile, is at home hanging out with his dad, and he's uh, a shepherd, so he's watching some sheep and doing all that fun stuff. Well, I don't I have no idea what that's like because I've never shepherded sheep, but it's probably pretty cool. And he's out there. <laughs> and it's, sorry to all the sheep shepherds online. You guys are awesome, man. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> David was one of you. Um, and, and David's dad comes out, Jesse, this guy, Jesse, and he says, um, he goes, I need you to bring basically some snacks uh, to, to the guys out, you know, at war. He gives them some bread and some cheese. So it's like cheese and crackers. So David loads it all up and he goes out to the battlefield to deliver, you know, the, the cheese and crackers. And when he gets there, he sees this giant and he hears what he's saying and he can't believe it. He cannot believe that there's this giant like taunting the army, like God's army, and nobody's done nothing about it. So he shows up and he starts asking questions. And King Saul is also like, hey, if anybody will step up and handle this, you can have one of my daughters. Like there's some prizes. Man, it would, I wouldn't want to be the daughter of a king. <laughs> That's how they always sweeten the deal. Listen, man, I really need some help right now. And if you don't just want to help me for money, you can also have her. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> don't do it. So David is interested. <laughs> He's like, okay, so we get the daughter, we get some, like, we get some prizes, and all we got to do is kill that guy? Like, that, that seems easy enough. And, um, and, and, and they, they, Saul ends up hearing of it. Actually, his brothers hear him first, and one of his brothers tries to tell him to shut up. So he's got these big brothers there, and they're like, what are you doing, man? You just come out here to see a fight? Well, David, at this point, he is the fight. Like, come out to see a fight. Literally, nobody's fighting. They're just standing around scared. And so he comes up, and he, uh, he gets called up, and he talks to King Saul. And I'm going to read some of this to you. So this is in 1 Samuel uh, 17, 33 through 37. And King Saul kind of like, hey, are you sure that you can even do this, right? Because nobody feels up to the task. And so it says that Saul replied, he says, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. 
When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. This is awesome. I'm telling you what, man. If, if some lion came and tried to get my dog, I have dogs, so I'm a dog herder. If, uh, I might just be like, dude, good luck. <laughs> <I'm not> gonna... <laughs> I hope you can fight. <laughs> But David goes out, you know, he's grabbing these things by the hair and and killing them. He says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies. He's got to bring his circumcision into it, man. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Okay. (laughs) It was part of the law back then. It wasn't just, okay, there wasn't just some prejudice against... Anyway, it doesn't matter now. Do <laughs> I need to back out of this. All right. <laughs> he said, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul say, said to David, go, let the Lord be with you. So the, the, what I want to point out here is that David, in, in this picture, and you're wondering, how does this have to do with giving? Well, this has to do with trust. And I think that giving has to do with trust. And here is David who shows up, and he sees this, this enemy of the Lord, and he rises up and says, you know what? I've had victory in my private life. The Lord has been faithful to me. Man, I have faith that I can take out this guy too, right? There's little Jackson right there. Hey, big Jackson, there's little Jackson. Glad you guys had a chance to meet. (laughs) And I just love it because, you know, as we talk about giving a little bit extra today, and maybe you've never, never gave, or uh, maybe, you know, you've given a little bit and you feel like, hey, maybe I can give a little bit more, that it, it, David had the, the, his trust was built in the small things. His trust was, was built by taking risks with the Lord in the things that, you know, in comparison to what he's about to do now, I mean, wrestling bears and lions. Okay, don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't think that's that small of a thing. But to David, it was. It was just kind of something he did. And it's interesting because he gives, he, he doesn't put his um, trust in himself. He puts in his trust in God's ability to, to give him victory. And I, that's what, what, what I really love about this is that he is trusting God for the victory. It's not showing up like, well, I'm just so strong. Of course I'm going to win. No, he's like, no, it's, 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 I've seen the Lord come through for me before. I believe he's going to do it again. I, I actually think this ties into giving really well because I can tell you that as somebody who tithes and gives, I've seen the Lord show up time and time again and bring victory into our life. I've, I've never seen him leave us hanging. Right, and a lot of times that's I think that's where our trust is built. It's through the small victories that actually lead us to be able to, you know, maybe trust God to to do more or give more. Right? David is about to put. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about money. David is about to put his life on the line. You know, he's about to put. And here's what's interesting, though. I think some of us would be like, "Oh yeah, I'll do that." But then when it comes to our money, we're like, I don't know about that. And that's kind of a, an interesting um, thought. I think, you know, a, a lot of times you'll talk to people and be like, oh, I'd love to just lay my life down for the Lord. I don't care if they take my life. But it's like, what about your checkbook? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Was not my life enough. You want my money too? <laughs> Come on, too far. Because <laughs> you know I'm going to take it with me anyway, right? I need that. No, you can't take it with you. But um, he's about to lay it all down. If, he, if the Lord doesn't come through on this one, he's not just going to have empty cupboards. He's going to have, you know, he's, he's going to die. And uh, verse 42 through 58, let's, let's read a little bit more. It says, he, he looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy. So he's not very old. He's glowing with health and handsome. That's nice. And he, <laughs> and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog? Okay, so this was, uh, oh, this is Goliath. So, sorry, let me get you back. He's going out now to fight Goliath. 
Okay, so he says he looked at him, he saw he was a little bit more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now, part that I, I left out that I'll put in right now is that David tried to put on King Saul's armor and tried to take King Saul's sword, but it was all too big for him, and he's never used it before, so he, he let, left it behind. So he didn't even bring out any protection. In fact, he brought a sling with him, and he picked up some stones. These, you know, they were probably big. They weren't just little tiny rocks, but these, these stones. And his idea is that he's going to whip these around. A sling, they, it's a, a long piece of leather, and they whip it, and then they would hurl it at something. So David has gone out here to meet this guy without even any armor. So even more so, his life is on the line. If he gets struck, he's got nothing to even protect him. I mean, he really trusts the Lord because listen to what he says. He says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with the sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. See what I mean? I told you the Bible is cool. (laughs) This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Amen. Amen. So you see, like David's not going out there in his own confidence. He's literally going out there in the confidence that the Lord will show up in power. I I love that. And he is confident. Hey, side note, did you notice that he didn't stop and have like, you know, a prayer meeting and try to get confirmation from like 20 people before (laughs) he went out? (laughs) Anybody, right? There's something on that. You know, I, I love it. There's certain times where you just know what the right thing is. And in this moment, you know, David had no question that the right thing was, was to go out and to face this guy. And it wasn't a matter of skill. It wasn't a matter of, you know, swords and, you know, and, and having the right gear. It was all about the Lord's heart for Israel. It says, and as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, and it struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. That's bad. If that happens to you, you go see a doctor. <laughs> and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Just one rock, too. You know, it wasn't like he took a bunch of shots. It was just one shot, and that was it. And David ran. I love this, man. David ran and stood over him. He didn't just wait. He booked it. And he took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from his sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. <laughs> when, the Philistines saw, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged towards with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along, along the Sherim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine head and brought it to Jerusalem. He took this big old head with him. <laughs> <laughs> he put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. So this guy's an, un- David's an unknown at this point. Not an unknown after this though, right? Uh, the king said, find out whose son this young man is. As David's, David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. <laughs> he not let it go or sit it down. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Put it in a bag or something. (laughs) He says, whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. And I just, I love, there's so many nuggets throughout this. 
the story right here. One is, you know, one's very interesting that David goes on to um, later in life uh, to adopt the, the sword of Goliath as his own sword, which is, I, I think is pretty interesting that the sword, uh, the weapon of the enemy, um, after the enemy was slain, became his weapon. Um, there's probably a lot on that. Uh, just, you know, I, I, I think a lot of times, you know, what the enemy uses to try to take us down, the Lord gives us victory, and we're able to use, um, in a sense, that very thing to actually do kingdom work instead of, um, so yeah, whatever the, the enemies tried to steal from you, I know for me, it was years of, uh, you know, in and out of jail, drugs and all that stuff, but now, man, I have the ability to speak into to people's lives who have been there, and so it's pretty cool stuff. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it, it wasn't about uh, what David had. It was all about his trust that the Lord would provide the victory, that God is true to his word. I love that, man. I want to have that kind of trust in God. You know, when David was chosen to be king, and this is also in 1 Samuel, uh, nobody really understood because they looked at him and they're like, are you sure this is the guy? And, and the Lord says, man, I don't look at the outward appearance of a person, but I look at the heart. I love that. And David was a man after God's own heart. So it's like, I just, I don't know. I, I read this because I think all of us want to be a person after God's own heart. Like, God, you better watch out, man. I'm coming for that heart. You know, it's, it's like, dude, I'm doing it, right? That's, that's what I want to be known for. So I, I got to look back and look at the life of David, who is not a perfect person, and just kind of see, like, how, how did he approach God? And there's just so much that, that you can learn in the story. I think this piece right here of trusting God and going, could you imagine going out to fight somebody with two armies on each side of you in this, you know, giant, everybody's watching you? I mean, that's a, that's a crazy situation. And going out there, like, with confidence that God is going to bring the victory. Nowhere in that story did I hear David like, I hope you come through for me. Like, you know, so, so often we pray, right? We, a lot of times we're just hoping God will keep his word to us, especially with provision. We look out at the future and we're, we get scared. I don't want to do that, man. I want to look at the future and be like, I don't care how many giants are out there. The Lord will give me victory, Right? I want to walk in, in that, that level of, uh, of trust. And I want to stop believing that it's just my job as my source of provision. We talk about God being our provider, right? I think we even sang that in one of the songs. Right? And it's just like, but do we believe that? You know, I want to get to the place where I just believe it through and through that God is my provider. Because I want to, I want to relax. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in anxiety over whether or not uh, the, the future's going to have provision for me. Here's the thing about trust, though, that, that, that I love to bring up, is it's really easy for us to say that we trust God. Um, you know, I, I think that all of us in this room would be like, hey, do you trust God? We'd be like, yeah, I trust God. But trust really is only proven through the choices that we make and when, when we're faced with that adversity. So it's really easy to say that I trust God on a good day. You know, I just got paid. I'm like, yeah, I trust the Lord. Of course I do. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? You know, and, and it's, it's easy to say that, but we don't really find out until we're, we're faced with reasons to doubt. And then, and then we find out by the choices that we make because we're going to live our life according to what we believe, Right? And so our choices will be a reflection of what's in our heart, right? Um, you know, giving is a, a, a great way to find out if you trust God for your provision because when it comes time to give, do we hold on or do we trust, right? And uh, I, I just want to be to a place where no matter what God tells me to do, to give time, talents, treasure, whatever it is, that I, I trust him that everything's going to be all right, that it's going to be okay. And I want to get to a place in my life, you know, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had or, you know, just, you know, conversations that Chelsea and I and my wife have had. We're trying to, to plan for the future, and it, it seems like 
oftentimes there's a fear. I don't want to live in fear of the future. I want to live in, in excitement and anticipation that God is going to, that he has a purpose and a hope for my life. Oh my gosh, who did it? Oh, bless you. Well, you're a pastor. You can bless yourself. <laughs> I'm joking. Bless you, man. <laughs> oh, I learned that from my dad. No, I didn't. Sorry. I'm just joking. Um, you know, and, and then, okay, so here's one of the other things about David's story that I really loved is that his breakthrough became breakthrough for other people. So David went and took out the, 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 the giant, and as soon as the giant fell, the army of Israel, they rose up in courage, and they chased away the army of the Philistines, killing them along the way. And so it was this breakthrough that was started really with a personal breakthrough for David as he was a shepherd, and seeing the Lord show up and keep his word to him, and keep him safe, and keep him alive, and keep him provided for, that led him to have confidence against Day or Goliath, that the Lord would keep him safe, that the Lord would give him victory. And all the people that were watching that were terrified saw what the Lord did in one person's life, and they all rose up in courage and believed that God would do it for them too. So my point is, is that if we don't step in to, to taking risks with the Lord, we might be robbing somebody else of their breakthrough. Because they might just be waiting to hear your testimony or to see what the Lord did in your life so that they can feel like they can do it too. And they, they chased him along the way. They, they killed him and they took all their plunder. I mean, it was a great victory. It was a great victory. So my encouragement this morning, you know, is in regards to, to giving, my hope in my heart is this. It's not just giving that each of us would take from this story and say, you know what? Maybe it's better to trust than to fear. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's safe to trust. Maybe it's safe. Maybe God will come through. Maybe I don't have to be afraid today. Maybe I don't have to leave here full of anxiety and worry and doubt. Maybe it's okay. Here's a big one. Maybe it's okay for me to let my guard down. I think that, 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 that's a, a, a big source of anxiety is I think we all have our guard up all the time because we think something out there external is going to get us. The economy, the next president or... Whatever it is, you know, we have all these fears that are so rooted in, in things that are not God. And so no wonder we have our guard up all the time, because we're like, those things are going to hurt me. But if we truly believe that God is my provider, and that he's watching, and he's actually working things for good in my life, that he actually has a plan and a purpose. Who has a plan and purpose? He does. That's pretty nice to know that somebody else has a plan. Because I think we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the plan is, and we have a lot of anxiety over the freaking plan. Like, I need to know what the plan is. But God is saying, man, I give you permission to drop your guard and just live out a, a kingdom lifestyle. Focus on that. Seek first the kingdom in all, what is it, in all his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Yeah. Something like that. There you go. That's why dad's here. That's what it is. Matthew 6, I think. Isn't that a beautiful way to live? To just focus on living out kingdom lifestyle. And letting our guard down, letting trust into our heart. Man, we feel so much better. How many guys like feeling like safe and relaxed? Man, I'm here to tell you right now that you are safe. The Lord is with you. You know, the scripture says, if God is for you, who can be against you? I'm not saying that your life's going to be perfect, so don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just saying, I think we have, a lot of times, have our focus on things that, that aren't bringing the fruit of God into our life and, and, and out of our lives. For next year, 
grassroots revival, man, we have a lot of, I would say, hopes and dreams for the future of this church. A church that has only been around since 2020. Uh, started at a time where most people were like, don't start a church. <laughs> you can't even meet. We had some meetings, okay? But here we are almost four years later, and it's pretty, pretty incredible to see what God has done. And next year, there's a lot of stuff that we would hope to do, but we're not going to be able to do it without money or extreme favor. So there is extreme favor, too, because sometimes people are like, hey, you want a building? Why don't you just use this building? But it's going to take all of us to, to really get to a place where we are sustaining and uh, thriving as a church. It takes, it, it takes a family doing family, church family together to, to not just come and, you know, be blessed by a good message and a good word, which is good, but to also participate in the forward movement of the church. One of the things we really want to do next year is we want to get our own building. Um, we want to get a, have a place where we can do classes uh, during the week, a place where people can come and connect during the week, a place where we can uh, maybe even, you know, have a daycare or something and help take care of kids so, so parents can go to work and know that their kids are in a safe place with, with people who aren't teaching them crazy things. Right? I mean, this, that strangely enough, that is a worry that you have to consider now. Um, we want to do missions. We want to send more people to Moldova. We want to, you know, explore what it looks like to, to have a, a long-term presence in a, a foreign country. That's pretty amazing. Um, we've been in talks about starting a school of ministry. We want to do a school of ministry, a grassroots school of ministry, and, and, and have a place for people to come and learn how to do ministry and be taught by people that, that have done it, that have experience. Um, we, I mean, we want that real bad because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, really passionate about building leaders up from within. You know, I, I don't think there's a person in the room that, that can't do what I'm doing and maybe even do it better, right? Because I'm, you know, I say a lot of things that we might have to cut out of the video later. <laughs> you, you might not have that problem. <laughs> we want to start small groups. You know, we want to get, you know, some little home church action happening and, and continue to, to, to build a community. We want to do special events for Revival House. You know, we, we got guys that are on fire for the Lord and, and uh, you know, choosing a life of discipleship. And we want to be able to send these guys to conferences and, you know, and, and, and continue to pour into their lives while they're with us. We want to do more church-wide events, you know, barbecues, get-togethers, you know, all this stuff. But we're not going to be able to, to get there, you know, as sad as it is, without some money. <laughs> and I'm not asking anybody in here to fund it all. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's on you to fund it all because here's what I know. The Lord will provide. So I'm not, I'm not sharing any of this from a place of fear or anxiety. I'm not, say, you know, even coming like, if, if you don't help, we're not going to be able to do any of that. I don't believe that at all. I've seen too many times the Lord show up and do stuff that seemed impossible to ever think that he can. But I am asking you to, to sow into the house that, that loves you so much. Because I'll tell you what, we, all the leaders here at Grassroots, and I think you know this, if, if you hang around for more than a couple weeks, you're going to get like 30 hugs, you know, in, in, in about five minutes. And, you know, I hope you're, you're cool with that. But we really love each other and we really are praying for each other and we really do want to bless um, each other's lives. And so that's really more of, of my heart is that, that we all lock arms together and we all participate as a church family together. And like I said, I give, you give, we, we all give. <laughs> so nobody's, nobody's asking for, for a, a, just a handout. We're all participating together. 
But the last thing I would say as you give, the, the, the Lord says he loves a cheerful giver. So don't give today or next week because, you know, you, you feel bad for not giving. Give because you're excited to sow into the kingdom of God. That you're excited to see what the Lord will do in and through this local church. Because we got plans and we're going places. We got, you know, our eyes set on giants that we want to slay. You know, we're, a, you know, we might be a small church, but we're a giant slaying church, right, Ethan? Amen. Man, there's, I, I felt like the Lord, I was reading one time, uh, Solomon, you know, the Lord asked him, he said, what do you want? And Solomon asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for money and all that stuff. And um, and so the Lord's like, well, I'm actually going to, because you asked for something good, I'm going to give you all that stuff anyway. So he actually got it all anyway. But I thought to myself, I'm like, what would, what would I ask for? And, and I, I was talking to the Lord. And I'm like, you know what? I just want the head of the giant. That's it. You know, I look out in our, our, our world today and I see people afraid. I see people divided. I see, you know, all the weird stuff. And it's like, man, if I could just take the head off, whatever that is, that I'd, I'd be all right. I'd be like Thanos sitting back and like, not Thanos, that's a bad example because Thanos was a bad guy. Imagine a really good version of that that didn't kill half the universe. <laughs> was wrong one? I don't know. All right, let's pray. Father God, we just, uh, Lord, we thank you that you are our provider. God, we thank you that you... Uh, never let us down, God. Lord, we, we choose this morning to step into the opportunity that is right here in front of us to live unafraid. God, to trust you with all of our heart, to not lean on our own understanding anymore, to read your word, to open up your word and read your promises and say yes and amen. Those are for me. To know that they are for me that I'm included. <laughs> I've not been overlooked. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Lord, you, you planned me before I even got here. There's not a person in this room that is overlooked by God. Lord, I choose to believe that you have a portion set aside for each one of us that nobody can touch, nobody can steal, nobody can corrupt. Father, I just say thank you. And I ask God that you continue to give me and everybody in this room the courage to get up every day and choose to trust you over everything else that we could choose. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to bring up Pastor Ron. Wow, excellent message. And actually, my lovely wife is going to come up here with me. So during worship, I just heard the Lord say, and, and I was just looking at everybody in here, and I felt like the Lord said, I have so much to say to my children. Would you stand in the gap this morning and help me to speak through you? And I'm not saying I'm perfect. And, and you know, we're not perfect in everything we hear. The Bible says we prophesy in part, right? But there are some things that I felt like the Lord gave us this morning. If it doesn't ring true, just flush it. But if it does, Paul said to Timothy, revisit those prophetic words that were spoken over you when the elders laid hands on you. In so doing, you can fight the good fight. And there's things that the Lord wants to speak deep into our hearts that will help us to fight the good fight in this life. And so, Donna, would you come up here? I'm going to let... Uh, Donna, this is my wife, Donna. I'm going to let her start because I know the Lord gave her some good stuff. Thanks. Um, so I am a seer, and um, I do a lot of the prophetic through the seeing. So um, if you don't know much about that, it's basically I just feel like the Lord has... Um, said some words over you guys and it's spe very specific but I want you to know that if it's not the Lord if it doesn't ring true to you like Ron said just flesh it so um, this gentleman and the great thing is I don't know most of you so 
with the hat with the sunglasses. I got a word for him too. No, I did first. Chris. So I felt like the Lord said, I just saw the word thankfulness over you, that you, um, and, and I heard that it's your calling, and then I heard the Lord correct me and say, no, it's your mandate. So if you just pray into that and ask the Lord, what does that even mean? A mandate of thankfulness. Uh, Tag on. So, Chris, I'm going to have you stand up, if you don't mind, just for a second. I, I felt like the Lord showed me your heart, and you've got this heart to just pursue Him. There's this thing inside your heart, but it's like also in this pursuit, I felt like there was, you felt like, I don't know, kind of roadblock kind of things. And if that makes, does that make sense in the pursuit? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, a lot of us have felt that, right? But here's what I saw. this. I saw this picture of this, like, hook that's maybe, like, hooked in your back pocket, connected to something. I don't even know what it's connected to, but I just saw you take that hook and pull it out. So would you do that, just a prophetic act of, I'm just pulling the hook out. Yeah, and I felt like that prophetic act is going to actually help you to propel into what God has for you. So I just bless you with that. Sit down. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for being so brave. Um, so the young lady behind Chris. Um, so I saw two mountains over you. Um, I felt like the Lord said, I hope I'm right in this, but I saw that you have a sister. Okay. I saw that you and your sister are mountains of faith. You know when you just see a mountain and you're like, wow, it's there and it's solid and that's not going anywhere. I felt like the Lord said that's the type of faith that you and your sister have. It's like um, I have a twin sister and she's blonde and I've always been brunette and it's like the blonde and the brunette and they are the solid mountains of faith so stay right where you're at stay solid in your faith for the people around you to see how solid that faith is um the man with the camera back there lance <laughs> um i saw you with your hands wide open and i felt like the lord said you are a giver you're a giver in like you hear Holy Spirit say give and you give it doesn't matter where it doesn't matter what time it doesn't it's like you're completely connected to the Holy Spirit and you have your hands wide open so the Lord says thank you for being a giver his giver um okay Ethan, I know you, but I felt like the Lord said that um, you are the armor bearer to Jonathan. I felt like the Lord said that you say all the time, with all my heart and soul, I'm with you. So whoever you're serving, which I assume would be Nicholas, thank you for being the armor bearer. And you, and this row right here, so there's a few things, and I'm sorry, I'm keeping, keeping you too long. Uh, so I felt like the Lord said that the four of you have this crazy breaker anointing. It's an anointing to break through barriers with people who need healing body soul and spirit it's not just a healing of like a, a counseling situation it's like when you walk in the room you can feel the breaker anointing happen so I would just say seek that see what that looks like so are you two married okay and are you <laughs> are you two married <clears throat> so I felt like the Lord said 
this couple, this couple, and are you two married? I assume, yeah. Okay. So I felt like the Lord said that um, you guys are going to be walking into um, a marriage counseling situation. And I felt like it had something to do with what Nick was saying earlier in this next year when he's got that building when you guys have the building that you're looking for your marriages may not be perfect but nobody's perfect and no marriage is perfect but I felt like the Lord said that you have an anointing to be able to to speak into the other people's lives who need that marriage counseling, who need to be encouraged with hope and love and joy, that marriage does, doesn't look like a bondage, but it's a joy to be married. So take that to the Lord. Um, this, yeah, I felt like the Lord's, I, I saw the word traveler over your head. I felt like the Lord said that the traveling is like what you like to do. It's like a passion of yours. And I saw you actually traveling to different mission fields. It's not your typical, let's go to Africa and be a missionary. It's like out of the box traveling. It's out of the box missions that you're able to just go into these places so these footprints they're actually not your footprints they're the Lord's so I would just say be brave and ask the Lord where do you want me to go to next where's my next mission oh gosh um I Mitch okay so I heard the Lord call you Kevin. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Some things that the Lord tells me is so crazy. But so I'm like, Kevin, what is, okay, I looked it up. So one meaning means handsome, <laughs> which I'm like, okay, that bears witness. <laughs> But then the next description means birth. And I feel like the Lord is birthing something new within you. That not only that, but I feel like you are to help in birthing something new in people. That people, you can come alongside them and birth something new. Encourage them, empower them to walk into a, a new birthing season, something new that they've never gone into before. Yeah, and what I saw over you, I saw just this power and authority on your words, and it's like the Lord is holding it back until you birth into who you're supposed to be. And I felt like the Lord said, I want you to meditate on the proverb that says, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and those who love it eat from its fruit. Because I feel like there's a revelation of the power and authority in our words that's going to come to you. And it's like, I just see you being very careful with what you speak because you have a new revelation of how powerful words are. And I think the breakthrough is actually going to come. You're actually going to be preaching at one time, but you're going to be declaring things. Do you feel called to that? You know that? Yeah. And so there's, there's words you're going to speak over people because you've you've actually gotten a hold of the authority of the words and you're going to declare a word over a matter and they're going to have breakthrough into their new season because you are going to have such a deep understanding of the power of words and you're going to use it to advance the kingdom. Yes. And a couple more. Um, okay, the baby boy you're holding. Your son, right? I felt like the Lord said that he is a true worshiper, that he actually was created within your womb to worship him so i would say you know just pray into that if that rings true start empowering him to do so get the guitars out get the pianos out let him just 
worship him in the ways that he's created him to do. You watch, watch and see. Um, hello. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while, Greg. So I've, I saw the Lord shave your head. He shaved your beard. He, sh he, he, he shaved your whole head. And I felt like the Lord said, you're coming into a place that you have been for years. It's coming from the inside out. And I felt like the Lord said that he is doing a new thing in you. That it's, um, I saw your, your head like pointed down. But after the shave, I felt like your, your head was lifted up. Your, your eyes were looking up. The horizon is your future. The universe is your future. You have a lot to look forward to. Lift up your head. Let the Lord shave you, whatever that looks like, it, metaphorically or whatever. But I feel like the Lord, I, I just want you to be able to look out, look forward into something that is so much bigger than you think it's way bigger than you think you understand it is deeper than you think it's extremely huge get ready because the Lord is doing something let him take you there and I forgot I Jackson yes of course, Jackson. I, when you were worshiping and playing the guitar, I saw these waves of power. That's all I could say is just these waves of power. It literally came from heaven and it brought some power out into the universe. It's, um, yeah, it's just way deeper than, it's not just playing a guitar and singing, but it's, it's his heart moving through you. So, yeah, thank you. Well, should I bring her next week? <laughs> well, wow. Thank you, Donna Marie. Bless you guys. I think we have a worship song and, uh, Whatever the Lord said to you today, just lift it back to him and worship and say, Father, speak to my heart about this. So I bless you in Jesus' name. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and
give my vows Is it a song I sing Then here's every melody Just tell me what moves Just tell me what moves you Just tell me what moves you Just tell me what moves you Just tell me 